You're listening to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast from Clear Creek Community Church. To hear more, check out clearcreekresources.org. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we've recently had the IF Gathering, uh, which is a women's conference. For those who don't know, it's a women's conference held around the nation. Brings in all kinds of uh, speakers, all kinds of teachers, both men and women, by the way. And I thought it would give us a great opportunity for us to sit down, have a podcast, and talk about the benefits and, and maybe some challenges that uh, that have women and teaching put together. So uh, the, one of the reasons, actually, I wanted you guys here is because both of you are Clear Creek teachers. So Mandy, Mandy Turner, uh, she's been on the pod several times Mandy before. Mandy Turner. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, she she currently teaches women's systematic theology. How many years have you been doing that? It's my fifth year. Your fifth year. So teaches systematic theology. She's also a contributor for Clear Creek Resources. She's done a lot of stuff as far as writing and content and, and, and Bible teaching. Uh, Rachel, uh, as well, you guys all know Rachel if you ever listen to the podcast. Um, she teaches and has taught how to study the Bible. She's every once in a while, I think, teaches systematic theology. Whenever right. Manny can make her do something, right? And then um, she's also the director of Clear Creek Resources. And so and not only are both of you uh, passionate about women growing in God's Word, but you're both engaged in making that happen here at Clear Creek. So you've been, mm-hmm. you're vested. Um, and so I, th- that's one of the reasons I wanted to have both of you here. You're, you're my experts in the room, and we'll take that as far as we can go. So well, we're look at that kind of intro, man. That's a great intro. There that's you go. That's a great intro. Yeah, we're grateful. Up. All right. We both care about this a lot. So yeah. we're grateful to be having the conversation. Well, thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. So by the way, they didn't want me to say anything about them when we got here, but I I, I want people to know why you guys are here, because I really deeply appreciate what you guys think about this. And so with that being said, let me give you the first uh, kind of question to get us into discussion. Um, why, when we think about women's events, uh, why do we have something like the If Gathering? Why do we have, as a church, events at the campus level, and uh, different campuses get to do different things, and then sometimes we even do them church-wide, that are, that are just same gendered? And again, the context here is women's uh, stuff, so uh, why do we do that for women and solely for women? What are the benefits behind that? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. And it's one that we sort of wrestle with a lot. You know, why should we even do this? And uh, we believe that God created men and women different and complementary. Mm-hmm. So, f- you know, to partner with one another, to help one another. And so what that means is it's a good gift when we're all together because that's That's the body of Christ. That's how he designed us to um, interact in his kingdom and creation. But that also means that men and women are different. And so there are unique challenges. There are unique giftings. There's unique perspectives. And so when you when you have women all together in the same space, we sort of have the ability to speak into those particular perspectives. Right. Um, that's one reason why we do it, which I think is always a good gift. It's also just, it's, it's fun because we get to have fellowship. There's intimacy with women all together. And I think with men all together that you're not going to have whenever you have everybody in the same space. That's another reason. I mean, there's a lot. Do you have any, there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I and and not even saying that. Oh, it's better. You have better intimacy when all women are all men are right. together. It's just a different yeah. kind of connection for sure. Well, you've said in the past. You and I have had conversations offline about um, why at Clear Creek we want to provide. Uh, ministry events, and really not even ministry events. I remember you and I had a conversation about uh, we were doing systematic theology. It was co-ed. Uh, I, I, I lead both men and women, and you had just suggested, or maybe someone had, maybe doing something like that just for women only. And I, I just remember just being the guy going, well, why would we need to do that? Why do women need to hear from just women? Can they not hear from men? And of course they can, but I really appreciated your answer. So if you can roll that back, that kind of conversation, remember any of the talking points from that, I think it'd be helpful for people to hear like, why is it important for, especially in a discipleship sense that women hear from women? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, for sure. All of our classes at Clear Creek, we, it's, it wasn't as though we were limiting them to men, and right. now all of a sudden we're letting women in. Um, no, all of our classes have always allowed men and women to learn and grow together. But, um, you know, s- research just shows that women having a seat at the table doesn't mean that they have a voice. Right. Um, that our culture has conditioned us to 
see men as more authoritative. Um, men feel just in general. In general, yeah. for that's for women and women see men as more authoritative. Men see themselves as more authoritative. Um, women are less likely to ask questions in a mixed group. They're less likely to share their opinion. They're more likely to get interrupted um, or spoken over. Um, they're less likely to be seen as influential um, because they just don't tend to speak as much. And so offering a women's only class can provide a chance that some of that those barriers are kind of taken away, oh. that all of a sudden everyone's <clears throat> on the same page, everyone's got the same playing field. Um, that's not to denigrate in any way mixed classes. There's a place for sure. those too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a women's only environment can – make some things possible that maybe aren't quite as possible in a mixed class. So my wife, Jennifer, both of you well know her, know her well. She, she teaches how to study the Bible, uh, which is a women-only class. And one of the things she tells me is she's convinced, and I, I want I some affirmation and maybe some, a little more illumination here. She's convinced that there are women that attend that class that say things in that class that would never say anything in a mixed group. Um, and or having a, a, a guy lead that. Uh, and usually both of those are connected. So um, it's going to be a guy that leads a mixed group, so to speak. So um, do you guys experience that? Uh, when I say experience that, have you seen that in the classes that y'all have led or uh, what we have at Clear Creek? Because my wife would just, I think she would just kind of say amen to whatever you've said because in her own personal experience, she's like, I can't tell you all the reasons why. Uh, I'm sure it's a lot of what you've said. But um, it, it seems like that's not a unique experience to have a woman in a class led by a woman amongst women going, I, now I feel freedom to say stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. There's an article that I just read the other day that was talking, they were specifically looking at uh, mixed groups in like an accounting program. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so not a church deal. No, this wasn't a church deal. This was a school thing. Yeah. Um, and that the, these groups, they tried to make them diverse. And so they tended to have at least one woman in every group. And yeah. what they saw was that in order to have the women speak as much as the men did, and this was just like in, you know, projects or discussions over the class or whatever, in order to have the, the, the women speak as much as the men, you had to have not just a majority of women in the group, but a super majority. So four out of five members of that group the attendance. had to be women. <laughs> Otherwise, the <clears throat> men <throat> always <throat> talked more. Mm. Now, I am not saying like, whoa, men, they're so arrogant. Right, oh, they right. can't shut up. No, it really is. We're all just conditioned by our culture. Yeah. And so when you can remove some of that, women do, they just feel, for whatever reason, they feel more freedom to make a mistake. Yeah. They feel more freedom to ask the question that might seem dumb. Yeah. Um, I think they feel more connected, more, there's more relational environment. That's so. helpful. Well, what? and I think part of that conversation, so there are the women in the group together right. who feel free freedom to talk with one another. And then there is a difference when you, when they have a woman leading them and teaching them, right? That's part of the equation and that's part of the comfort level, but it also just changes the dynamic. They think, oh, you're leading. And so now I can ask you questions and we can talk about different things than I could ever ask a man. Is that because, and I don't want to oversimplify this, so forgive me if I, is that because um, it's so unique to have a woman leading something, period? That they feel like, oh my gosh, I, you know, forgive the language, but one of my own here leading, I, I feel a connection already just because of our gender. I, you know, I, that, that kind of loosens up some of the wheels in my head and my heart to want to share, or is it, I'm, I'm just curious, what's the dynamic that causes that? Yeah, I think yes and more. Um, that's, that would be my answer to that. I think that, that, you know, representation matters. Yeah. So when, when you see someone who is teaching or leading, who has your perspective and experience, right. it just changes the room for you. You can hear in a different way. You have different expectations of maybe what you could do. So I have actually been surprised. I've been in ministry for not very long, right? Like not very long. Haven't even done very much. But the amount of women who have come and told me, hey, I'm so glad to hear you doing this or saying this. Yeah. Um, that's meant so much to me yeah. to have your voice there has been overwhelming to me, yeah. like surprising to me. Yeah. Um, and just affirming that it really does matter that. And to me, it's just a, it's, it's such a good gift because it's just this um this ability to make the women feel seen and loved, not only by our church that right. does see them and love them, yeah. but by God, yeah. that they really do feel like just 
being seen and known and valued in a different way. Yeah. And I think for the last last 50, 70 years or so, the, the majority of attendees in a church service and are part of a local church are women. Mm-hmm. So like 60% or something to that effect. So to even to be a part of something where you're the majority sitting in the pew, but if you don't go to a class or an event or something else where you don't see anyone leading, uh, I, I could see how that could you know, have some consternation for folks. I, I want to move it back. <clears throat> That's super helpful. Let's take some of that and apply it, if we can, to even teaching here. Now, Rachel, you, you're involved with putting together the whole IF gathering, uh, and you've got to look through. There's a whole slew of teachers that mm-hmm. are uh, in this lineup, which that's not unique. Most conferences do that, and they're teachers from all around the world with all kinds of backgrounds. And, I, and if I remember correctly, the IF gathering has been with men and women speakers, mm-hmm. that's teachers. Right. So what are the strengths, uh, if you can look at that, what are the strengths and weaknesses of, of having that kind of exposure where our, our, our ladies, really, I'm singling out ladies only because it's the IF gathering, but anything that we do where we are exposed to different teachers that really aren't Clear Creek people, mm-hmm. what are the strengths of that? What are the weaknesses of that? I'm going to start with you because you're putting it together, but I want Mandy to jump in as she feels. Yeah, I mean, I think to. that there are a lot of strengths and weaknesses, like you're saying. Um, I think it is a good thing to hear from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think this is an opportunity where we feel confident that we're going to hear really good teaching, right? These are gifted speakers. They're knowledgeable scholars and people. And we know um, what they say in general is going to be really great for our women. We also know that there might be some things that people Mm -hmm. say um, that we don't fully agree with. So, but I think that is helpful for the most part for our church. So we get to hear from all these different perspectives while also being unified in the gospel, in what we all believe as followers of Jesus in the church. And so I think that's just always a really lovely experience, right? We get these giftings and diversity, but we still know who we are at Clear Creek and we're still unified with them. So that's great and exciting. Um, that's also the challenge is that we, we don't, we don't necessarily hold to exactly the same beliefs that every single speaker is going to say. Um, that's, and that's just on that side the diversity of speakers. There's also the challenge of the fact that they're just on a screen. I mean, they don't, they don't know the people in the room. They can't interact with the people in the room. And there's, I mean, there's just other challenges there too. Let me ask you this. Um, you, you said that there's a strength in hearing someone who has a different perspective. Um, they may even come from a different confession of faith. And I don't mean like they're not Christians. I mean, they may come from a different tradition. And I, I know, I think, I believe, Mandy, I, I heard you talk about this as well. How, how is it helpful to, or maybe why is it helpful to hear someone outside of your tradition? You know, so we all have traditions, right? Clear Creek stands and whatever tradition it is, someone would say it's, you know, conservative, evangelical. You know, we have tribes that we're a part of with Acts 29. We're church planners. We're complementarians with big fancy words. How do we see gender in, in scripture and leadership and pastors and all this kind of stuff? With all that being said, uh, it seems like there are many different people in that IF conference that come from traditions that may not agree with our d- doctrinal distinctives. Although we'd all stack hands on the confessionals of the essentials of the faith. Why is that important? Why is it important, uh, at least it seems in principle, to hear people outside your tradition? Yeah, I mean, I think if I think we can look around our culture right now and see that we are very siloed in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. We surround ourselves with echo chambers of people who sound and think just like us. Yep. And so in every area of our lives, it's good to expose ourselves to thinking that might be a little bit different from ours, to challenge ourselves, um, to remind us that those people are actual people, not, you know, just talking heads with bad ideas. Um, They're actual people who are thoughtfully trying to do the best they can, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, just this morning, you know, I just, we just started a women's small group that that meets right before I was here. And uh, we were talking about you know, we're, we're going through our, our thing about the church being a missional community. Yeah. And we talked this morning about some complicated things. We talked mm-hmm. about complementarianism. We talked about our church being an elder-led congregation. We talked about baptism. Those are all things that we have as doctrinal distinctives, mm-hmm. but that heaven is going to be full of people who disagree with us. Yeah. Um, there are going to be I mean, people they don't who... have nicer homes than we'll have in heaven, but <laughs> right. yes, you're right. But they, there are going to be people who were baptized as babies. There yep. are going to be female pastors. Yep. There are going to be... Like, there are people who are seeking to serve Jesus, who are following him, who disagree with us on those kinds of things. And so a situation like this is a good reminder that 
yes, we want to reflect what we feel like is the best biblical interpretation we can come to. And yes, we want to obey that to the best of our ability. But we might be wrong Mm -hmm. or they might be wrong. We'll find out sometime. We just want to do the best we can. And Mm -hmm. they can still have value in the things that they teach. Mm -hmm. They're still going to offer us um, the scripture. They're still going to bring us to Jesus. So what's the, what's the dividing line when um, any person that, you know, seeking to grow in a certain doctrine of the faith. They want to grow in their doctrine of the church. They want to grow in their doctrine of, and I, we wouldn't use language like that. They <clears throat> they want to study X, Y, or Z. And you've got books that you know that would be helpful to them, but there's also within those same books, things that would be hurtful for them. Uh, or it, it maybe hurtful is too strong of a word, but aren't helpful. Uh, how, how do you know, uh, when, when is it right to give it to someone? Uh, and, and they've got to figure out what's right and wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, man, if, I, if I'm going to say best case scenario is let's go through this together. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's study That's good. together. That's good. Let's do this in relationship um, where when you have questions or when there are things that are uncertain, we can discuss those. I'm not saying I'll have all the answers so I right. can clear it all up for you, um, but we can talk through it together. Um, would I necessarily say you should make this person who is not in agreement with our doctrinal statement, should you do this with your small group? Probably not. Um, That would probably be not my encouragement. But yeah, read this. Yeah, study it. Come ask me if there's things we need to talk through together. Um, You know, I I think that there is, you know, even as a as a small group leader, I'm responsible. I really am responsible yeah. for the people in my small group. Yep. You know, that's one of the things we do at group up is that the elders come and they say, we're entrusting these people to you. Right. Um, and I, I take that seriously. We haven't even grouped up yet, but I still take it seriously. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I, I just told my group this morning, I'm, I'm not your Holy Spirit. And I really do trust the Holy Spirit within you that he's going to give you wisdom. Yeah. He's going to lead you. And so I do want to protect and to nourish them. But I don't want that to turn into paternalism yeah. where I'm keeping fences up um, instead of allowing them to, to, to grow in wisdom. Yeah. I think, at least in my experience, uh, as just the teaching pastor and people ask me, because one of the things I have to do is I have to prove materials to be used in small group. What I'll tell people is like, this is not appropriate for small group because people don't have in your small group the level of discernment that you might have as a navigator. It's one of the reasons you're a navigator. And then if you just go, we're going to go through this, but you're, excuse me, if you recommend it and you don't go through this with them, you're, you're leaving them to try to decide and decipher stuff. They're not theologically, doctrinally, biblically prepared to do so. And so what I'll tell people often is like, this is a great book for you to develop personally. This is not a good book for you to do with your small group. Now that's few and far between because there's some books that I mean I some of my favorite books and maybe y'all could say the same. Some of my favorite books are from from uh, authors and leaders that there's so much I don't agree with them on traditional uh, from the tradition they come from. But on this topic or on this issue, they just ring the bell right, and and I, I highly respect it. I do think there's something about tribalism we have to be careful of, where you're in a tribe, but when you come tribalistic, that I can only hear people from this kind of tradition, that's where it can become problematic. But there's a tension there with that, right? Because you have people that are young Christians, and they, they, they whatever they read, it must be true. That's mm-hmm. the stuff we have to be careful about. Uh, anything you want to jump in and on, on add to that? No, I mean, <clears throat> I'm just, you know— saying the same thing as you guys are saying, but we're, you know, there's a difference between listening to other perspectives mm. and having that grow your faith and strengthen your faith and just accepting everything that you read or hear. Yeah. And, and that is a discernment issue. The only other thing I would add about um, growing in discernment when it comes to studies for yourself or for your group is, you know, navigator is not like a magic word, right? You know, you don't like become a navigator and then like all of a sudden, you know, right. it really is, it's a process and it starts with, it's about you. It's about, and I think like when I get questions about resources or even big questions about the faith or doubt or whatever it is, the first thing I want to tell people is you got to learn how to study your Bible. All right. And that seems like such a simple answer, but I, I really believe it to be true. If, if you take the time and make the effort to build your own biblical literacy and know how to study the Bible for yourself and have good foundation there, then you're going to have, or you're going to begin to have your own discernment when it comes to other Bible studies Mm. and books and speakers that come to the door. You're going to go, oh, well that, I don't know about that. I don't know about how they're interpreting that passage. So you can, anybody can do that. You just have to start that process. Yeah. It's probably one of the reasons I like 
frankly, uh, when small groups just go through books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, you, there's no mandate. You, there's no law that you have to. But often a lot of our small groups are like, hey, we're in between states. We just want to study a book of the Bible because that's where you can really learn some, some of the, if you will, the, wor- the rules of how to read the Bible, the hermeneutic for it, which is a big fancy word, just means the art and science of, of interpreting the scriptures. Uh, we just got through finishing a podcast earlier today where we just once again talked about, and I feel like it's, it's another good time to do this. Like if you haven't been a part of how to study the Bible, those classes, or especially for women, if they don't want to do that, they want to do women of the word. I mean, these are, these are classes that can build a foundation in you where you can start to interpret the scripture in a way that's healthy, that has its own checks and balances, that's, that's has some kind of vindication and justification throughout the, you know, church history. And uh, that allows you to be able to, to, to develop, excuse me, to build up and develop your discernment. So and speaking of discernment, we talked about the strengths of listening to different kinds of folks at the IF gathering. Uh, what, what are potential weaknesses in that, if any? Well, I think those are the weaknesses, is that um, we're, you know, we're not necessarily <clears throat> aligned with everything they're going to say, so you have to develop the discernment. And also there's just the community aspect. I mean, these aren't people who know you. Yeah. These aren't people. I think that we're just sort of drawn to celebrities. Okay. We're drawn to celebrities. We're drawn to people on a, you know, on a pedestal. And we also are drawn to just give me information and that's all I need for spiritual development. And that's just really not the way of the Christian life. I mean, it doesn't actually work like we think it works. Um, I was actually talking to uh, Greg Poor, who is developing, you know, um, a talk on soul care. And he was talking about Ray Ortland's model for spiritual discipline. Yeah. And it was gospel mm-hmm. plus safety mm-hmm. plus time. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking that's part of the problem here. So you, you have to start with the gospel and I'm, and I'm sure that all of these speakers will have that, Sure, but you don't, you can't have safety in time when all you're doing is, you know, focusing your spiritual development with speakers and teachers. I mean, safety requires relationship and confession. You have to have time spent in the word and with God yourself. And so you just lose all of that. But I do think that in our culture, there's just this belief that if I just have enough information, really good information by really gifted people, yeah. that's enough. Well, let me, let me jump off of that. Um, you said a couple of different things. I want to hit celebrity later on, uh, and maybe this will be a gateway to it. But what do we, what do we, I, I know that there are individuals and not just women. I think this happens with men and women followers of Jesus who basically take their teaching menu, their diet, if you will, uh, from a selection of teachers that aren't really a part of their local church. They go to their local church because, you know, their kids like the kids ministry or they like the music and their the, the preacher slash pastor is, uh, he's tolerable. Mm-hmm. But then the rest of the week, it's like, I'm going to have my favorite people on my podcast. I'm going to watch their YouTube. I'm going to, you know, if you will, imbibe all of their teaching through books and whatever. What are we missing if we're being primarily taught by people right. who, uh, though incredibly gifted, right? And, uh, but, but aren't a part of our fellowship. So like Mandy, you know, if you, if you wouldn't mind taking that lead on that one, let Rachel jump in on it. Is there anything that we miss with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, as Rachel has kind of already alluded to, you know, when we talk about specifically even about small group, but really just our local church, is that it's a place to love and be loved, to know and be known, to serve and be served, to celebrate and be celebrated. Um, I think Jen Wilkin is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I don't think I you could do? let a podcast, a podcast go by without mentioning For her name. For those who don't know who she is, she she's is a, a Bible teacher <laughs> out of Dallas and a kind of a sister church in right. our and network. She's Mandy's and best friend. <laughs> she, right. I met her once at a conference. We took a picture together. Um I think she's great. Yeah. She actually can't do any of that for me. Mm-hmm. She doesn't even know me. Mm-hmm. I don't know her. Even the, I mean I follow her on Instagram. Sure. I read her books. Um so, so in a way, like, she can serve me, but I can't serve her. I can celebrate her, but she's not celebrating me. Yeah. Um, we, we don't actually know each other. And so even if she's teaching excellent truth, which sure. I think she is. Yeah. I think, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm thankful that we have gifted teachers that are available. We have more available now than ever has been available in the history of the world. Yeah. And it's, that's it's a true. gift, yeah. right? That's a gift of the body of Christ, you know, serving each other. It's still, she doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. And so she can't apply that truth to my actual life. She doesn't know my kids' names. She doesn't know what town I grew up in. She doesn't actually know me as a person. Mm -hmm. And that, 
that means that I can take in from her what I want, and yet I don't have to commit to her in any way. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any obligation towards her. It's a a one-way relationship. Um, In the local church, we commit to each other. Um, In the same way, you know, you may get up on Sunday morning and teach the gospel, but I can go to you if yeah. I have a concern or if I have a question that yeah. in a way that I can't with right. someone who is we'll just do a far podcast away. together. That's right. <laughs> and we can talk about all my concerns. <laughs> that's our next podcast now. I, I think that's so helpful to hear. And, and, and I love how you bring it back to um, when we say small group leaders, it's navigators. It's interesting. Uh, when we baptize people, uh, and I, I like Jen Wilkin uh, as well, and my wife loves her as well. I haven't seen her baptize one person at Clear Creek. But I've seen a lot of navigators baptize people, and uh, that's not a slam on her. She's playing a role that God has for her in something beyond the local church. By the way, she is a teacher in a local church, which we'll get to here. I mean, she's she's got accountability and she's got commitment. And um, but with all that being said, I mean, the people that are swinging the biggest sticks in the lives of the flock here are the people that are involved in the lives of the flock here. And so that's why navigators are such a big deal for us. Not that they have to be these incredible five-star theologians. Uh, they're, they're doing the everyday life with people uh, where they're applying what we learn, which to me is that's that's the 99% is like, we, we know more than we've ever known about the Bible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm over-educated on what the Bible teaches. I, I, I'm under applicant, uh, excuse me, under uh, application. So I want to apply mm-hmm. more of the Bible. And that's why I think navigators are so incredible, frankly, uh, and why they're so, they're much more important to be a part of a small group that does this together than to just be this this person that has a disembodied relationship, if you will, with, with fantastic teachers and, you know, uh, th- th- on both men and women. So uh, Rachel, I'm sorry. Did you want to jump in on any of that? Anything to add? No, I mean, I just think that we talk about, you know, head, heart and hands when it comes to yeah. understanding the, your, your Bible. And I do think we tend to stay in our heads, you know, for some of us like this, if I know this, then I am a fully devoted follower. Um, but I think that if, if, if you are learning as much about um, what it looks like to, to live like Jesus and to draw people to Jesus and to develop disciples from a teacher who you've never met than by, you know, the, the man who's been serving coffee for 25 years of the church yeah. or the woman who, you know, brings your kid ice cream because she has a black eye, then you're, you're missing out yeah. on the full life of yeah. being a disciple of Jesus. That's super good. That's super good. Well, now you dropped the word celebrity and I want to, I want to, I want to pursue that just a little bit. Um, several of the speakers in the lineup for this if gathering that we've had are, I, I would say have some notoriety to them, uh, in, in evangelicalism, which I don't want to get too too deep in, but in, in that circle, they have so much notoriety that people really see them as almost Christian celebrities. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe what I want to ask is how how does how do we, how have we gotten to this place? Because this is not unique to women. Uh, there's just as many men out there that maybe more, uh, like Yancey Arrington. No, don't go there. Don't go there. No, we'll edit this out right now. Uh, but to be honest, I have friends of mine that are considered, I mean, I have good friends of mine that are considered, uh, would be considered Christian celebrities. And, um, uh, so maybe what I'm asking is, cause I, I want to tie this into teaching and, and, and this whole deal specifically as we're focusing here on women, like how, how does that happen? Why are we here? And I know that's, we may be oversimplistic in our answers cause this is a podcast. We don't have seven hours. We can't get into all that, but, but it, can you guys give me, ladies, give me any insight into at least from your perspective, what you see going on? Yeah, I mean, I, it kind of makes me picture like a, a like a show or something. Like, so you want to be a Christian celebrity? Mm-hmm. Here's the path. Yes, right. Um, uh, so l- there's there's some ways you can do it. You can marry a pastor. That's a good way. Uh, there's lots of pastors' wives that um, oh, okay. that become celebrities because they're married to a pastor at a big church, and so they have kind of a built-in fan base. Uh, you could be the daughter of a pastor. That works. Uh, you could be on a reality TV show. Um, I wonder you, who you're talking about. Just, <laughs> there's just lots, lots of people who are sitting here going, "What are they? Yeah, pick one. Yeah. Um, um, you you know, you can, uh, having some sort of skill that's internet friendly. I mean, if you're a great speaker and you can do videos that catch people's if eye, if you're funny, if you're a, a, a writer, um, if you, you know, man, there's a, there's a Christian 
author speaker person who uh, on Instagram that I follow because she paints and she paints these beautiful pictures that I like looking at them on my Instagram. Right. And so she has she has quite the following because she's a really she's really, really talented. It's a mm. gift, you know, and she has things to say about Jesus in the midst of that. So and if you, you know, whichever one of these paths you take, <laughs> if you start if you kind of end, can attract a following, whether that's locally, if you're at a big church or if it's online, um, it actually just then increases because then kind of the machine kicks in, right? The publishers get interested. Yeah. Um, the conferences start inviting you. Yeah. Um, and so you get more and more and more notoriety. But if you take those Bible teachers you've ever heard of yeah. and you compare them to the number of women that are faithfully teaching the Bible all across the country week after week after week in their local context, it is literally like a drop in the bucket. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily reflect um, character, certainly, um, or competency or maturity. Not, I'm not saying those people who are celebrities don't have those things. I'm saying that's not what you get rewarded for mm -hmm. in any of these contexts that we're looking at. Yeah. That It's just not. Yeah. And so it's great if we end up with people who are famous Christian speakers who do have character yeah. and maturity, yeah. um, but that's, that, that doesn't sell on the internet. We used to right? have, uh, I'm sorry, I, I no, didn't no, mean to no. interrupt. We used to have just a, just a, Agree with you in this sense. I, I used to have a conversation with one of my buddies where there was this kind of um, there was this kind of practice, and it still happens, where they would invite like a Christian athlete to come speak, and uh, the only reason he was there was because he was famous. It wasn't because he actually knew the Bible. In fact, later on, a lot of these guys that came to speak at their churches would have some kind of moral falling or failing, and and you know that weren't even Christians anymore. At least didn't profess the faith anymore. But because we could get someone, it was almost kind of like we can, we can, we can mm -hmm. get a crowd there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm not saying you can never have someone who is in a field that people recognize uh, and has some notoriety to come and talk about being faithful. I mean, I but there's there's a temptation that we legitimize people just because of their follower count. Mm -hmm. And somehow they became great Bible teachers, although we don't know their background. We don't know theologically where they came from, but because the machine, as you said, I think it's well put, the, the machine, the publishing houses got there. And, and let's just make no, you know, I don't mean to be cynical, but they're there to make money, a lot of them, right? That's that, their job. That's their job, to make money. And so if they can, if if you write really witty and you're funny, if, if you uh, tell a really great story, you know, whatever it is that you're good at. Uh, and I would like to think, um, that part of that would be you, you, you're doctrinally sound, you, you've you been trained well. That's not the case. And that goes across the board. I'm, I'm not talking about even women now. I mean, there's right. guys right now that uh, I, 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 I just shudder to think that people would read this person and go, this is the person that's going to teach me about Jesus and the gospel when that's like, no, dude, they're just a pretty face, probably making half a million dollars off of that book deal. And, uh, and you're buying it because it looks slick. Like that's the stuff that I, I want to be careful of. So all that being said, it seems like that's the world that we live in that we have to be very careful of. Did you want to jump in on any of that, Rachel? What are your thoughts? Oh, man. <clears throat> I have a lot of thoughts about this. This, I, is, this is only an hour show, kids. <laughs> I know. I, I just think this is a really important topic. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to be really, really careful. I mean, you were we were talking about discernment earlier, and this is where we just need to learn how to develop discernment. Yeah. Um, and I think it's both for those who are leading and those who are trying to find people to be led by. Um, because I think in both instances, we're just very, very tempted um, by following in personality and, you know, attractiveness, whatever that means, whether it's, you know, whatever that means. Um, instead of character and Christ -like, Christ likeness, I, and I think it's sad. I mean, I think that there's this idea that like Paul was this like celebrity, you know, like that he was just like, oh, I was like, I'm going to be like Paul. He was this great <clears throat> teacher and he did all these things like, no, Paul suffered yep. and was persecuted yep. and was an outcast. And then he died for his faith. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what it looks like to be a Christian leader. Yeah. And that sounds really intense, except that it's true. Right. And so I think that. Um, for people who want to teach and lead and to find this pathway to success, just be really careful because, you know, I mean, Jesus, whenever two of his disciples were sort of vying for a position of power, he said, it, yeah. 
you know, the Gentiles do this. That's the people who are not right. the people of God. <laughs> yeah. They lord it over one another and they, that this is what they do, but it should not be so among you. Yeah. If you want to lead, you have to serve, yeah. you know, it's so sorry. I don't want to like get too intense about it, but that's, no, I think it's great. That, that's, that's what leading as a Christian should really look like. That doesn't mean you can't have success. doesn't mean you can't have a following, but we just have to be careful about how we really view a Christian leader and how we view Christian leadership. Yeah. And that's really what it is. It's the cruciform life. It's yeah. following in Jesus's example as a servant. So, you know, one of the things that I, I think about that when I hear what you, uh, when you hear what y'all say is, I, you know, if you're reading or listening to stuff that sounds like, I mean, I've never heard this at our church before. Maybe there's a reason you've never heard it at our church before. Like you, you should always, I mean, if someone's listening to this and they're not at Clear Creek, this would still apply. If, if you're getting some kind of teaching that you think is unique or novel, you've never heard it before, you might want to check with your navigator or your campus elders or your trusted Bible teacher. You know, if you're in system, you know, go, go to, you know, Rachel or, um, or I, I really like, that's one thing I was going to say, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There is nothing I would rather do than like talk to people and like help people navigate stuff like that. I was this. trying to set you up. Yeah, I, I know. Like I'm that. serious. Like email me because. Well, no, there's the whole reason that we have teachers that are both men yeah. and women and we ought to be, avail ourselves of those teachers. And so, I mean, again, I'll say it one more time. The reason I have you two ladies on here and I, 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 I mean, I, I feel like I know some of our women teachers. We have Jenna Craft. We have Tiffany Habaducci. I mean, these are people that I, I highly esteem. And I mean, I, I think it's a small circle right now because we, there's just, the, the trust level has to be so high with teachers. I mean, even James says, you know, if you're mm -hmm. a teacher, whew, there's a stricter yeah. judgment coming. So, um, and I think that we ought to avail ourselves of like, listen, uh, if, if there's something you've never heard before, but it sounds really cool and you've never heard it here, there may be something we just haven't addressed. I don't want to make it sound like we're, we're so universal and comprehensive, whatever we've done. But if it sounds really different, different, it, it's always good just to check that. Mm -hmm. And so that, that let, let me just say this. <clears throat> There's something I've noticed lately as the teaching pastor. One of my jobs, as I said earlier, is I, I have to vet and, and approve uh, small group material, uh, which is something I've done for since I've been here because we want to uh, guard against bad teaching and or false teaching and uh, give our small groups, uh, especially with navigators like, you know, we're not seminarians. We don't know every, you know. Uh, we're not that developed as theologically as we want to be. And so we try to, I try to serve them by approving materials and, and sometimes disapproving or unapproving other materials. And I've noticed, I, I don't think this is unique to women at all. Uh, Cause I think both men and women do this, but I've just noticed recently, they're just, I've, I've had to, I've had to thumb down and, uh, you know, red flag quite a, a bunch of material uh, for women's Bible studies that I've just never seen before. And I, I think, one of the things that, that I'm, I'm learning is that because of the sheer amount of teaching that we have on things like YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, things like Instagram, which I didn't even know Instagram was such a big influencer, but apparently it is. Uh, but, but what really happens is what I've heard some people say, uh, and only recently is this just, I've, this has been with women's studies, is like, hey, I was just, I typed in something in Amazon and this is what came up. And this looked cool mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. And, and can we do this? And, um, and so... How can we, I know this is part of the discernment issue, but how can we be discerning about who's worth listening to? And are there any principles for discerning the good teachers out there and the bad teachers out there? And I don't want to make this about, again, I'll just repeat this. I see this with both men and women, but uh, probably because women don't have this, somewhat of the access that, that men have had over the years, especially with when everyone was complimentary and you know, all this blah, blah, blah with all the pastors mm -hmm. and they have all their, they can do books, they can do their sermons and women had to create their own niche at some times. And part of that's working through social media, how do we discern the good from the bad? Yeah. Well, I, I think that you're being super generous and, and kind and careful in how you're talking about this, which I think is you're good. You're not talking to me. It's not you in this room. So. <laughs> because I think that this does happen with everybody. It, it seems to me to be particular to women, not because women are dumb or not discerning right. or bad at, you know, studying the Bible or creating Bible studies. Nothing inherently different between a man or a woman not, in this issue. Yeah, not with this for right. sure. Um, but because of just um, how the culture creates celebrities and access and, and the amount of information along with the fact that we, we as complementarians, there are not women pastors. And so, and there's less women in seminary 
until yeah. recently. Yeah. That's just part of it. So it is a particular problem with women, and I think that's okay to say. Um, Definitely a challenge. For it's sure. just a challenge, yeah. and so and and what and our desire is that they we would find good material for women yeah. because it's out there, and we want women to be biblically literate and to be like fully devoted followers of Jesus no matter what. So I just want to say it's okay to say that. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think one of the things that comes into that, too, is what what a gift that there's actually a huge market for women's Bible study material. True. Um, there is a huge demand for it. Women want to know the Bible. Yes. They want to be taught it. Um, and awesome. Like, that, we, we, we absolutely support that. Like, man, study yeah. your Bible. Like you said, yeah. that's what yeah. we want yeah. groups to be doing. Sure. Um, we also recognize, like... Not every, not everyone can just open the Bible and understand it on their own. Um, even, you know, sometimes talking about it in small group can just be like, let me share my ignorance while you share your ignorance. Yep. Um, and so I, like, I commend small group leaders who want to find some, a, a Bible study teacher who can kind of scaffold that material and help them to understand it and interpret it well. Great. Yep. Like, that's, that's what we want. Um, but like we've all kind of said... Women don't necessarily have the same and haven't had the same kind of setup culturally yeah. in the Christian world that men have had. We, it's harder. If you have a guy who's writing a Bible study, he's probably a pastor mm -hmm. or he's a professor. And so even if you don't know him at all, you can sit, go to his church's <clears throat> website and right. see what his mm -hmm. church believes. Yeah. Um, if he's at a seminary, you can go to his seminary website and see what is their doctrine. Um, and so you can evaluate people even if you don't know them. Women, the associations just generally aren't as clear. Right. Um, a lot of women aren't on staff at a church or at a seminary. Um, most women may not even say like what local church they're in. Even if they do and they're faithful, they just they don't feel like they have to share that information. So it's just harder sometimes. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it's not worth trying to to see yeah. well and to do well. Yeah. I mean, just for the record, when I I, I, I did this yesterday, so someone brought me some mm -hmm. material. Uh, they didn't. They they like it from what they've read, but they don't know much about it, and that's the problem. Uh, and that's across both men and women. We like it what we've read, but we don't really know if there's more coming. If this is going to be any mm -hmm. good, because what they gave us was so little and da da da. So what I do, especially for, and this was a particular uh, ministry to women. Now it's really it's kind of an internet. It's a it's an Instagram ministry more than anything. But one of the things I look for is like. Uh, when they talk about, so again, trying to help people, if you're, if you're a navigator trying to decide, especially if you're in a women's Bible study or a men's Bible study, but specifically for women because of all the kind of the, the dynamics that are mm -hmm. at play, all right, go find the bios. Go look at what, the, what, what churches do these people. So like literally yesterday, I'm looking online mm -hmm. trying to find where these ladies go to church and then find out, oh, man, they're, they're part of some fantastic churches. Uh, one of them had a, went to seminary at this ex-seminary. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. a great seminary. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's things you can look for, but you, you, don't, you have to do way more work. I mean, just like you were saying, you have to do, because there's not the platforming that, that yeah. pastors already have by default, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to do those kinds of things. I, I always tend to also think like, listen to, if you if there are people that you know that have read that book or ministries that you know that you trust that have reviewed that book, go read those reviews. Uh, I mean, those are the kind of things I try to do to do some of the heavy lifting, if you will. But I think all Christians should be doing that. Um, yeah. you know, uh, it's hard cause to go like most of these people because they can't get a major publisher. Cause sometimes you look at the publisher Hey, I love everything that comes out of Crossway or the gospel coalition, but I don't like this cause that, you know, these are hit and miss over here. And these people, you just, you stay away from period. Uh, if a woman can't get into that, who's really a gifted Bible study teacher, she's got to create her own. And so that's where you have to just do the hard work, but that's where the discernment comes into play. So, yeah, I think that the first step is recognizing that, um, all Bible studies are not equal. So I think even just acknowledging, I do need to sort of cull and figure out which Bible studies are good. Cause some, you know, that's hard for some people like, Oh, this is just a Bible study. Oh, sure. I'm just going to read it. They're not all equal, you know, everyone doesn't have the same, you know, training yeah. or, or doctrines or whatever. Yeah. So that's just a good first step. So it's important to get there. And then I think to me, it is all the things that we've already sort of talked about. I do think it starts with yourself, which is part of that, you know, just knowing that you have to have discernment and then building your own biblical literacy. Yeah. So you have a place to start and then community. So it's a little bit easier for some people to be able to go online and know which seminaries or which organizations sure. are trustworthy 
But if you and if you feel like I can't do that, then you just ask people. I mean, no, that's no, no, part no, of the no. beauty. You, you yeah. don't ask just people. You, you ask, ask people like Rachel yeah. and Mandy and all these other people that or your group guy, or, yeah. your, group guy. or your pastor, or your campus right. elder. Well, that's, that's, well, yeah. that's the beauty that's of being, and that's the what community. That's what I was going to say, y'all. Oh, sorry. Hey, we were excited. We were excited. Hey, say it quicker. We're ready to go. I know. That's the beauty of the local church, though. That's why, and that's the difference between listening to somebody versus being a local church. That you, We can have these conversations. We can walk with each other because we want to do that. And there's a lot of people who can get involved in that. Hey, don't get mad at us because Mandy and I are ahead. Mad. We're steps ahead. I'm we're just way down teasing there. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, listen. One of the re- Mandy, did you have anything to add to that, by the way? Well, I just, you know, the more I think about this question, the more I keep coming back to you. There's actually... Um, a scripture passage that I've been I've been trying to memorize because it was convicting. Um, it's from James three, where you, you just quoted a minute yeah. ago about about teachers, right? Um, but further down in the chapter, it says, um, "I'm going to read it." Yeah, so please, it's, please. It says, "Who's wise and understanding among you?" And I'm like, "Well, that's a good question. Who is wise and understanding among us?" It says, "By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom." It says, "But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast or be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom—this is a good part. No, it's all good. Yeah. But the wisdom from above is sure. first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, and impartial and sincere." And I just kept coming back to that because I think that's what we want, right? It's not just about, can they give me good information? Right. It's, um, is the wisdom that they give, Mm -hmm. is it tainted by selfish ambition? Yeah. Um, Is it tainted by boasting? Um, Is it full of purity and peace? Um, Is it reasonable and gentle? Um, Again, we don't we don't always know these people, right? But you you can sometimes get hints, right? That's what the social media is good sure. for that, yeah. right? Um, um, how do people respond when they're criticized? Yeah. How do they respond when there's rebuke or disagreement? Um, do they? And who are you looking for? Yeah. What type of leader are you really looking for? Yeah, that's true. Well, I tell you this. Um, Our time's up here, but this has been full of wisdom, and I really deeply appreciate uh, both of you taking time out to talk about this. Uh, You know, this this whole Genesis started out with some things I was experiencing from the teaching pastor and and was just blessed to have you guys come talk with me about, hey, this is really what we think is going on and some things we could talk about. And let's just talk about in general about how wonderful it is to have uh, that God has men and women that gift the church. uh, And of those women, there's some that are teachers, and we ought to be able to celebrate that, and both of you do that among with others at Clear Creek. And so grateful for your investment, uh, not just today, because I think it's helpful, but the, the investment you guys have had over the years, along with our other ladies that I've mentioned and more, you know, Denise Ward and Jennifer Arrington and, and all these others that have, uh, Carrie Rame and so on and so forth and, and more to come. And so may God grow us in the ways that he needs to grow us and, and do that together with men and women as we seek the kingdom. So thank you for your time. Thanks, TNC. Thanks for doing it. Good okay. conversation. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. If you haven't yet, make sure that you hit subscribe down below and check out clearcreekresources.org. We have videos, books, and sermons on there, as well as our audio podcast. Thanks for watching.